Have you or a loved one been trapped in the quantum realm for over 30 years? Do you feel like you suffer from quantum mania? Finally, there's hope for you. Tune into this exciting discussion to find out how. Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. And folks, yes, it's quantum mania all the way because we are here today to discuss Ant-Man and the Wasp quantum mania. And I decided to dig in so deep, I had to call in another Jeff to do it. That's right. Screenwriter Jeff Loveness is our guest today. And uh, look, I like this film. It has a good sense of humor. I like the world building that's doing with the MCU and the beginning of the Kang dynasty because Kang plays a great part in this film. And I got to say, it's fun to take a peek behind the curtain as to the different variants of ideas that were toyed with for this script. And of course, to learn more about the Marvel process for developing one of their movies. And of course, as I'm sure you know, this has a tie into the Loki TV series, which I highly enjoyed. And we basically had seen Kang for the first time there. So it was interesting to see where they were going to go with just that morsel of information that we get in the finale of the Loki series and how they were going to retrofit it to a different MCU movie. And they did it really perfectly, in my opinion, in which we get a backstory and we kind of don't get a backstory. We get a focus on a 30-year period, so we're learning more about this Kang fella and what his plans may or may not be. And uh, it's just really interesting. Obviously, Jeff Loveness, the screenwriter, is also writing Avengers, the Kang Dynasty. So there's going to be even more Kang all the time in your future. And I, I can't wait to talk to him about that one day. But for now, we are focused on Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. And without a doubt, Jeff Loveness was very generous with his time and really painted a great picture of what it took to get this film made. So I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you check out today's sponsor, ScreenCraft.org. You know, breaking into Hollywood could be a confusing, convoluted business. Fortunately, ScreenCraft helps writers with both the craft and the business of Hollywood. ScreenCraft.org has everything for your journey, from video lectures with your favorite writers like Tony Gilroy and J.J. Abrams, to hands-on career coaching with their writer development team. ScreenCraft also has some of the best genre-specific screenwriting competitions, with judges ranging from Oscar-winning screenwriters to top literary agents and managers. Hundreds of past winners and finalists have started their careers with the direct support of ScreenCraft by writing films for and being staffed on TV shows over at Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, Universal, Lionsgate, Blumhouse, ABC, and more. So if you're an aspiring writer, don't think twice about checking out out screencraft.org and of course while you're surfing around online i hope you also check out backstory magazine over at backstory.net our oscar issue is out by the time that you have heard this so i hope you check it out there too it is our 10th oscar issue in fact and is going to be packed with a lot of great stuff that i know that you will enjoy you could see the table of contents over at backstory.net if you've never read us before you could test drive us by reading our free issue in the backstory app or over at backstory.net on a desktop or laptop. And if you don't know this, our free issue happens to be the Avengers in-game issue. So if you've never read us before, it is a perfect issue for you to explore. And look, folks, it would really mean a lot to me if my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where you could see these interviews happen as Zoom interviews, it would really mean a lot to me if you consider supporting my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our chat with screenwriter Jeff Loveness about his debut feature film, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. I want to give our viewers a snapshot as to who you are, from whence dost thou hail. Where'd you grow up? And I know you went to Pepperdine and graduated in 2010, I think. Oh, yeah. Or ooh, 2011. Who, who even cares? I don't know. Uh, I'm from a small town in like rural California, 200 people. It's called Montgomery Creek. 
sounds very much like a true crime town or something. <laughs> yeah. And I just made like little home movies with my brother all the time. I used to make little like James Bond movies or we made like a 20 minute <laughs> Mission Impossible 2 remake. Nice. Uh, I would do like little comedy videos making fun of CSI Miami with my buddies. Like we just had nothing to do. So we just made a ton of movies and eventually put them up on YouTube when that became a thing. And then I did the same thing in college. I eventually, I, I did a lot of sketch comedy, things like that for the, like the onion for a while. And then I made something called Wes Anderson Spider-Man, which is like this parody of, you know, pretty clear, I suppose what that is right. um, with my pals. And that kind of was the first thing to really go. I hate the word viral, but I guess that's the word. Is there a better word? I don't know. Like, no, no, no. That's, that is that is definitely yeah, like word. that's the word that kind of that's the that's the video that kind of exploded for me. And then that sort of led to me just getting like plucked out of obscurity by Jimmy Kimmel, almost like a Charles Dickens novel or something. I just got like he liked the video a lot and I got an internship there for a bit and eventually he kind of threw me a bone and like gave me a shot and let me be a writer for like a little trial period and then I would stick around there and I just kind of kept going and I got to make a lot of is basically the same thing just a lot of sketches and I got to do stuff with like man Harrison Ford and William Shatner like all these um Kristen Wiig and like Michelle Obama I think I mean just you know wow. you get to work on a late night show and so you get to make just a ton of stuff with a ton of people and it was so much fun and wild and then I I kind of spun more more into like movie writing and more of like narrative writing. I want to go back before we get too far ahead. Sure, sure. Study at Pepperdine. Oh, I mean, who even knows? I, I was a I was a history major, which will probably come up later in the talk when we talk about Kane and all that. Yeah. Uh, the whole the whole plan was to be a high school history teacher. That was like my my goal, and then eventually like just the comedy stuff started hitting more and more and and so i pivoted but i started history but then ended with like film and media studies or like one of those weird just like soups okay. of a uh but you know it helps you watch citizen kane and stuff like that in class so. yeah yeah of course so how did kimmel discover you exactly i think he had just seen you know the wes anderson spider-man video on youtube it was a pure kind of like fluke you know like when it kind of exploded and went viral and then he had his like producers like scour the earth and <laughs> I checked uh, my my Facebook message and a producer over there uh, named Nancy uh, reached out to me. Nancy Fox. It changed my life. I, I'm so glad I checked that message request on Facebook. <laughs> like, I thought it was fake at first. That's awesome. Nancy's the best. Our our, our, yeah. our kids know each other. So I've known Nancy forever. And her husband, Peter, was a podcast listener when we first met him. But Nancy <laughs> works in the what I would call this kind of short film division of Jimmy. Kimmel. Yeah, yeah. she's like the yeah, she's a field producer over there. And That's I've probably awesome. been in her house more than anyone in Los Angeles. Angeles. We she always rents out or we use her house yeah. for any sort of like field bits and <laughs> any kitchen anytime there's like a domestic bit. I think I had Chris Evans eat a cheeseburger out of a toilet in Nancy in Nancy's uh, house and that was one of my final sketches on the show. It was a, it was a proud moment. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, my, my kids broke her light over her kitchen table. So there you go. I probably uh, broke that light as well. <laughs> there you go. Well, so, you know, I want to talk about those early breaking in times like Onion News Network. What did you do there? Because I've always liked the content that they've done. Oh, yeah. No, the Onion, especially when I was in college, that was like the gold standard of like uh, subversive humor and all that. Yeah. I wrote for the, man, this probably dates me a little bit. I wrote for their video section. They used to have something called the Onion Onion News Network, and then they right. had like Onion Sports Zone, and then those were online, and then they went and they were like Comedy Central shows and IFC shows for a while. And I was just a contributor, like I wasn't doing anything too major over there, but like it really did feel like the big break. I remember you got 50 bucks, I think, if they got one of your headlines, and I could nice. buy toilet paper that week. And I remember feeling like, God damn, Jeff, you're a professional writer. <laughs> you made you made fifty dollars making fun of like Paul McCartney or something. <laughs> that and the late night writing, which came later, really sharpens you and really like it really kind of makes you work every day at getting like 50 ideas and whittling them down to like the five that you like like that I took that job so seriously when I was in college. I just went back to look at my old notebooks and man, it seems like I was just like a Zodiac killer or something. All those little headlines I was writing out, but it, it, it was cute to see. Well, so then how did you wind up writing for Rick and Morty? Yeah, I mean, I was at Kimmel for about, man, I think six years. I mean, that job, you just get to write everything, which is really fun. You get to do like topical jokes, obviously political stuff and then field pieces. And then you get to do some rather big like parodies or sketches or, you know, short films, whatever. You have to write for like the Emmys and the Oscars. I think the correspondence dinner one time for Obama. Like, you get, you get kind of run through it all. But at a certain point, you're like, you know, you kind of feel like you've done it, you know? I think by the fifth time Thanksgiving rolled around, I remember I wrote up a sketch or I wrote up these jokes and I'm like, what's, 
this doesn't feel good. And I went back, I had written like the same jokes in like 2013. I was like, oh boy, okay. It might be time to <laughs> hang up the hang up the rifle here. So, I mean, I, I just kind of jumped off of that show. Luckily I've been writing pilots for years and, you know, trying to, you know, sell something, you know, it's, it's the typical LA story, LA writer thing. Like you have a pilot, it doesn't go, you know, you sell it, it doesn't go. A lot of ups and downs. Do you want to pitch us one of your pilots that did sell that didn't go? <laughs> uh, well, I did one with my pal Bridget Weiniger, who's a great comedian. He was a writer at Kimmel as well. We did one about like these 1970s revolutionaries, almost like the Patty Hearst kidnappers. Like, right. I think that one would still be pretty good. It was almost like a almost famous or four lions, but like 70s, like Nixon America, like people That's trying awesome. to bring down the United States. <laughs> what was it <laughs> that, called? I think it was just called Revolutionaries or something. Nice. Uh, probably could use a little more work on the title. <laughs> that was one that got pretty close, but never quite, you know, there's a lot that yeah, never yeah. quite landed. I had another one that was like a political political thriller, the Pelican Brief set of like a really shitty small town newspaper, like where I'm from. I thought that was pretty good. That was one of my first ones. I had a movie. I mean, there's just a ton that, you know, everyone's got like six. Wait, I, want to, I want to hear the movie. I want to hear the movie if you're okay to pitch oh, it. Well, the movie I might try to make soon. I don't know. That one. <laughs> well, tell that us one, the title. Uh, that one was called The Last King of Fresno. I might change that because there's that Pete Davidson movie about like King of Staten Island or something. I may need to may need to rework that title. Yes, and the a, movie The like, Last King of Scotland as well. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, it was a play on that. Uh, right. I, you know, I'm not great at my titles. I maybe that's the <laughs> lesson I need to take away here. But yeah, I've been writing a lot of stuff. And then finally, I did a TV version of that last King of Fresno. It was, it was a pilot before it was a movie. And that got me Simon Rich, who's just a great, tremendous comedy writer from SNL and like Man Seeking Woman and all this stuff. He hired me on his little TBS miniseries, Miracle Workers. Great room in there. Like that was my first like TV narrative job. And then just Rick and Morty kind of rolled around. And that's like the holy grail of comedy writing especially at the time. And they really made you work for that. You had to really like go through round after round and interviews and write all these cold opens. And it was really like, it felt like the Olympics or something. And so getting that job was really satisfying when you finally kind of got in that room. I haven't heard of a lot of places doing that. You had to write cold opens as like an audition? Oh yeah. They call them packets. For late night shows, they really put you through it. Like The Daily Show, John Oliver, SNL. They, they're pretty notorious for their pretty brutal packets. I don't know if it's a guild issue either. <laughs> That's maybe for another podcast, but <laughs> yeah, very yeah. Yeah, like I know those late night shows put you through a lot to get the job. And so I was kind of used to it. But Rick and Morty, yeah, I think you got to go through a lot, but you eventually get down to your two best cold opens. And I think one of them ended up being an episode, which is fun. Do you see that one with the face huggers that they, they kind of have on them? And they yeah, like um, alien face huggers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was like the and they destroy that whole civilization. It turns out they were actually really nice people. And like they <laughs> devastated all of them. Right. That, that came from a cold open. I was very happy that that made it all the way. Um, nice. Yeah, I don't know. Like that. That show when I got there, I mean, you really feel like you're in like the Top Gun school or something. Like they're really good writers over there. I was so scared. I was so like out of my depth. And that show was a dream to write on. It feels like Marvel was watching that show too because Michael Walden, who also went to Pepperdine, and did you know him there? No, no, we never okay. crossed paths. I think he's like a year or two older than I am, and I think he went to like the MFA program. I was only undergrad. Gotcha. But it was gotcha. very, it's very funny how like our paths have kind of orbited each other. For a yeah, while. because. Because he wrote on Loki and on Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Yeah, he and I wrote Rick and Morty at the same time. We got hired at the same time. So he's, he's a buddy. It's been really nice to have him kind of in the trenches with me while we're doing all this Marvel stuff. Because it's kind of hard to talk about unless you're kind of in the mix of it, you know. But uh, he's great. And he's a, he's a tremendous writer. And we're kind of opposites in a good way. And we're similar in some ways. And so I think we play off each other pretty well. Well, so tell me this, you know, because this is the big question. You had to jump through those hoops to get Rick and Morty. What did you have to do to uh, get Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania? <laughs> I feel like they thought I was a Make-A-Wish kid or something. Or like it happened very, it happened very fast in a way that I don't even understand. It's one of those just fluke Hollywood things of like, I'm glad I answered my phone that day. Like my manager, I, I had left Rick and Morty kind of similar to the Kimmel thing. I had written six episodes. I'd been there about two seasons. We had gotten like an Emmy, but like I just kind of had that similar feeling that I had at Jimmy 
Kimmel of like, you know, I could stay here like another three years. I could, I could keep going, but I also kind of feel like I've done what I set out to do here. And maybe it's worth taking the risk and just kind of jumping off, <laughs> which then the agents were not very happy about that. And <laughs> the parents thought that was a bad idea, but I had done a little bit of work here and there. I did some like punch up work on the new Spider-Verse movie coming out, uh, which was really fun. Some just comedy work on that. Sure. For um, any of our listeners that aren't familiar, like sometimes it's very common on big movies to do a day with comedy writers yeah, and yeah. they just take an already good script and they just see if there's any other place for a good joke. Yeah, so, yeah. I think I think that movie would be pretty good. They they didn't need me for that. <laughs> but yeah, like you know, you you, you get a few things in there. Yeah, um, they literally that, won an Oscar for the last one. So uh, I think they're doing okay. Yeah, they don't yeah. need the whole guy from uh, Quantum Mania. <laughs> but that was that was really fun, and I, I I really liked working on that one for a while. And then yeah, just didn't really have anything else lined up, and you start to kind of get that worried feeling of like, oh shit, like did I really overestimate myself? <laughs> did I throw away the most popular show on TV to do nothing for another couple of years or, you know, go back home to Montgomery Creek. But no, you, the, the manager called and he said, you know, can you get to Marvel at three o'clock? And I thought, yes, I can. I am not doing anything. <laughs> and <laughs> I just vibed with Peyton, who was the director, of course, and um, Stephen Broussard, who's like their kind of creative exec over there. And I just, I didn't know it was for Ant-Man. I came in not really knowing who I was meeting or what was going on, but I had grown up with Marvel comics more so than the movies. I just knew that world really really well. I was a hardcore like X-Men fan. That's always been my favorite. Nice. Maybe like fictional world. I think X-Men is just tremendous and they've only scratched the surface of like what they can do there. But like basically, yeah, you walk in, I saw Peyton Reed. I'm like, okay, probably something to do with Ant-Man I would assume. Okay. And then, you know, we just get talking about the characters and luckily those improv classes came in handy. You know, you can just kind of roll with the punches and with Marvel, I don't know how it works with every project, but like they knew they wanted to do something in the quantum realm. They wanted to do a complete tonal shift from the other two. So they wanted more of like a sci-fi quantum realm adventure. And then they wanted potentially to use Kane the Conqueror as the villain. And that to me just, that was too good to pass up. And like, I jumped on that right away. I knew Kane a little from the comics, but again, he he's a guy that touches every corner of the comics. So like, right. I wasn't a huge Avengers guy. Obviously, you 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 know, you know them and you, you know, you're in their camp, but I kind of knew him more from the X-Men and Fantastic Four side of things. And so I kind of came in through there. And I think maybe the thing that helped kind of coalesce the job for me was just getting that immediate connection between Kane and Scott Lane, because like who's lost more time in the MCU than Scott Lane? You know, he, he lost all those years in jail trying to do the right thing. He tries to do the right thing again, goes to jail again. He gets stuck in the quantum room for five years. He's lost like probably half of his daughter's life, you know, by trying to be a hero or trying to do the right thing. And suddenly there's this guy, time is nothing to him. He can give you anything you want, you know, and, and that that seemed like an incredible opportunity to really elevate an Ant-Man movie. I think the pitch in the room was like, let's put Ant-Man in an Avengers movie, like accidentally by himself. And obviously, you know, there's the ensemble cast and Wasp. Yeah, of course. And but like the, the core of the idea is like, oh, you should feel like, oh shit, like he should not be in this movie. <laughs> like he's, he's going up against Kane the Conqueror, who's like a... Avengers event villain and and uh, I think that lent itself to a lot of fun. Well right, there's a there's a line in the movie where where Kang says you're out of your league, Ant-Man, you know, just right, like yeah, making yeah. fun of him. So that totally works. I'm curious like at that point, what year was it? Would you say when you were brought on? I got the job in like March of 2020. <laughs> like, okay. Did you, did right. you find yourself pitching a whole bunch like you did on Rick and Morty or did that meeting with Peyton do it? I think that meeting more or less, you know, it kind of opens the door for you. But then, yeah, it's constant pitching from there. And like we had COVID, you know, like it was right. looking back. It's like hilarious. Obviously, a traumatic, terrible thing we all went through. But like you get this dream job and you don't think it's real. And then you go in, I think we went in for like a week and a half of kind of like story meetings or, you know, hanging out, getting to know each other. And then like, oh, no, nope, world shut down for, yeah. two, for the two years. So I was basically, you know, over Zoom like this, just in my apartment writing the movie. I, I wrote that thing from my couch basically for like a year. It's very bizarre to like be writing a movie that's $200 million budget. And you're like, I think I've met these guys twice <laughs> before I get into it. We're going to talk more about the connections to Loki, the TV show and everything else when we get in the spoiler section, but I just want to talk about your habit for a second. So obviously, as you told us, you'd written TV pilots and shows, you'd written a feature or two. Obviously, you know your way around writing, but you haven't been produced for a feature yet. Tell us about your right. habit. 
how important is outlining to your habit? Because I know TV writers, outlining is very important. It's it's kind of their start. Oh man, I'm the worst. As I'm working on Avengers right now, I need to listen to myself. I'm like, oh boy, I don't know if I have a habit or a. I go too much off of impulse, basically, and like that last minute deadline rush is always that's going to beat an outline any day. But no, no, you're right. Outlining, and this is where Rick and Morty was so handy. Like that Joseph Campbell story structure really is a winner. I don't know how much you know about that story circle, and you know, of all, course. All but tell tell our listeners what what you like about it. Oh yeah. I mean, it obviously, especially in comedy, there's always room for invention and, and turning stuff around. And Michael Waldron actually invented a fun little thing called the duck bill, which I'll get to later. But like the story circle in the Harmon mode is like eight points basically. And you can do anything from like Harry Potter to Lord of the Rings to showgirls to like an education. Like it is amazing how basic stories do work this way, if not all of them. It's a really adaptive thing. And I was like I said, showgirls, I watched it the other day for the first time and I was like, am I crazy or is this like a perfect Joseph Campbell story circle? Like, this is great. <laughs> it's like Showgirls has like Top Gun structure, like the basic thing. You know, you start out with your hero, your Frodo, your Sam, your Nomi, uh, you know, whatever, your Condide. They're in a place of relative comfort or a place of maybe stagnation or a place where they could stay but they want something or there's something not quite right with their life, then there's that inciting incident. That's usually point two. Either they're drawn into something, something happens to them or they leave, you know, or, you know, something kind of draws them out of their ordinary world. And it's okay if this stuff is a little vague right now. Like it, it, that's kind of what makes this, the, the structure so malleable. So point one, you know, Frodo's in the Shire, Frodo's hanging out, Bilbo's got a birthday, he likes Gandalf, you know, Frodo kind of wants to get out of here, he's he's curious, but he's kind of stuck in the Shire, point two on the story circle, oh, hold on, you know, stuff's going on, <laughs> he's got a ring, the ring has something going on with it, Gandalf's running away, Gandalf's scared, Frodo doesn't quite know what to do, but he's on a precipice point, three is like him... Oh, actually, no, maybe Lord of the Rings is different structure. Do we have time to go through all this or should I? No, speed we do. It up? We do. I mean, like okay. Star Wars, obviously, is something people point toward as well. But, you know, oh, yeah, that's the Kenobi one. shows yeah. up just like Gandalf shows up and right. takes him out of the safe world. And then, you know, it's the crossing into the more dangerous the world. Yeah. And, and like the point three on the story circle of Harmon is like, when do they stop being dragged along and when do they begin the journey? In that J.J. Abrams Star Trek movie, when does Kirk, you know, join Starfleet? There's always the most overused section of Joseph Campbell, which is the refusal of the call. Yeah. <laughs> which which <laughs> yeah, is yeah, when yeah, they're yeah. like, no, I won't save the world or I, yeah, yeah. I, oh, I, I'm in, not going to go on a quest for a ring. Who needs jewelry? This incredible adventure? No, sir. I have to get back to my little clock shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah, it's always that. I have too many clocks to make. Uh, yeah, and like I'm actually curious with Lord of the Rings structure, since it's such a big novel, is the threshold crossing him choosing to leave the Shire or is the threshold crossing him in Rivendell saying, I will take the ring to Mordor? I want to say it's leaving the Shire, though, because they encounter their first dangers, I think, before they even get to Riverdale. Yeah, you're right. It's tough, like with the novel and the movie and all the differences. Yeah. In the movie, they make a big deal of him being in Rivendell and saying, it's time to go home. Let's go home. We did what we had to do. And right. then there's that big deal of him making that choice. I wonder if that's just a, you know, kind of an escalated beat or now we're getting into the minutia of it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but yeah. I, I, think, I, I think I go with, yeah, it's him leaving the Shire and all that. And then again, that shows the flexibility. And like, I think sometimes with screenwriting guys, we try to go buy the book so much, but right. that's why, especially like in a novel or a, a, an epic feature like that, you can kind of give those nice character moments in there and you're allowed to kind of have some breath in there and that you get to have kind of those moments of rest and you get to push off again from Rivendell or whatever. So yeah, so, so like point three, yeah, let's say it's that. It's like you leave the Shire, that's the crossing of the threshold, and then you're in what's called the road of trials in the Harmon thing of like, that's when you meet, <laughs> I would say you meet your little buddies. That's when you meet like your gingerbread man and Shrek, you know, it's when you meet yep. Quaz and Veb and Quantumania. It's when you meet, you know, Mary and Pippin again, Strider, you get your first kind of ring rates. You get your first kind of glimpse of Imperial stormtroopers, you know, that kind of stuff. It sets up themes. It sets up maybe the flaws that are going to have to overcome later. And then that can kind of go kind of as long or as short as you want it to. Cause like, I just use fellowship. I think it's such a perfectly structured movie. It's so oh, yeah, it's great. great. I just love it so much from like the 
Rivendell all the way to where Gandalf dies is exactly 30 minutes. Like when I was writing Quantum Mania, I would just study fellowship. And that's such a great little act 2A. So if point four on the circle is, you know, the road of trials and all that, usually point four five is like your big kind of like traumatic thing or like the set piece of the movie. I don't know what you would call it because like, again, Lord of the Rings is kind of different because you're doing a trilogy. So there's not really like, they don't get the thing that they want, but like right. in a new hope, that's where like you face your major, you find the princess, you know, you, you rescue the princess, but there's a heavy price that comes with it. So like Obi-Wan is killed by Vader or, you know, Gandalf is killed by the Balrog there's always a kind of that moment of defeat or or a downturn. And then that's kind of like six as well. It's like you have your heavy loss. You think of turning back. And then there's usually that pick up a moment or that redemption moment of like, you know, Galadriel kind of gives you the gift of the goddess. I think they call it in Joseph Campbell's structure of like, who's that person that gives you kind of that push up? If your Dumbledore is still alive, that's where they usually come in handy with a little bit of you know exposition yeah. or where Princess Leia kind of comforts Luke after Obi-Wan's been dead. You can have heroes abandon the cause, much like Han Solo in, in A New Hope, stuff like that. But then there's like point seven is like a return threshold or there's like basically then what propels you the, the mission. Yeah, yeah. And what's your big act three set piece? What propels you up is like that, you know, Death Star battle and losing Obi-Wan, being so bad at the force, being face down with Vader, the guy who killed your mentor. You kind of finally utilize those lessons you were trying to learn in this point four of like, you know, doing the the droid and the force and all that. That usually comes in handy around seven or eight or so. Again, I probably did the worst story circle explanation of that. No, I mean, I, and then there's, the, and then there's the glorious return home and, you know, all yeah. that. People could look this up online and there's a couple of people that have interpreted Joseph Campbell's work, A Hero of a Thousand Faces. They not only map it, but they write it out as, you know, the hero's journey and and right, right. There's a bunch of books like that. So that's good. That, like you were it, using that stuff. And oh, so, yeah. And that return home is a good one, too, because you can do that two different ways. Harmon called it master of both worlds or Campbell called it that. And that's where I think of an education, actually. Did you ever see that with Carrie yeah, Mulligan? Of course. I think that's a beautiful movie. I mean, not even just on its story structure, but man, that ending, uh, I guess, spoilers for an education. <laughs> Anyone's yes. listening? Master of both worlds is great in like Return of the King. Yeah, he goes back to the Shire. They've defeated the guy, but the Shire is not quite the same. He does have that sort of like wound within him and the little rivers. He knows what Bilbo is talking about now. And he knows that like this home isn't quite for him anymore. I like that old Voltaire story, Candide, a lot, too, because he goes through all these adventures and he thinks that, you know, there's better worlds out there and he wants to keep exploring. and He keeps falling on his face. But then he comes back around and realizes, you know what, like just having your own little garden and having someone you care about, like that's really what matters. And he, he the guy who grew up in a castle is now, you know, working on a garden somewhere happier than he's ever been. Groundhog's Day, best example, maybe of like the guy who couldn't wait to get out of that town and live a new day gets a new day, but then realizes, you know what, I just want to live here. This is a nice little place to live. And I know everybody like if you can pull off a magic trick like that. I think that's uh, and uh, yeah, I guess we can talk about that more with quantum mania. We're going to get into it. So did you outline or not for quantum? Mania? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Good man. How long was your outlining process? Oh, months. Would you say? Uh, I think we ended up with about 30 pages, 35, um, okay. 40 in some regards, but it can be as big or as long as you want. Was it treatment form or bullet point? Both. I mean, they really put you through the reno over there. I prefer kind of a bullet point because I think you kind of get the groove when you're in the page. It always changes. I don't really like being chained to the structure and the form that you have. But to the other point, it is actually good to put down on paper what you think should happen or else you're just kind of bullshitting your way through it, which I'm yeah, the king yeah. of. At Rick and Morty, at least you would do a beat sheet which is like the eight points we're talking about. And then if that beat sheet feels good, you move into outline, which is an expanded form of that. And that usually gets to about, you know, 15 pages or so, 10 pages. And then that moves into about a 35 page episodic script. So with features, it's that, but a bit more exponential. You know, you got say a 10 page treatment, 15 pages, this, which turns into like a 30 or 40 page outline, which turns into a, you know, anywhere from 90 to 180 page script. Tell me this, how long did it take you to sit down and get your first draft? Most times it depends on like, you know, what's your production deadline. My first original movie, that last Kino Fresno thing I told you about, I probably wrote that from like October 
September through about December. So, you know, like three months or so. Ant-Man was probably about the same during COVID. It was like July through September or like June through August. I can't quite okay. remember the dates. But then, you know, you do so many passes and, you're, and it kind of blurs together. But yeah, about... I'd say most WGA contracts have it around three months to write a script. You dick around for the first month and a half, which is what I'm doing right now for Avengers. <laughs> so <laughs> well, so you have about two weeks to write a script. <laughs> when you sit down to write, how important is it to hit a page count each day versus mm. a certain amount of hours? Or, or do you use either of those as a marker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It varies. I'm kind of experimenting right now because I found page count is a nice metric, but then sometimes it's a little deceptive because you, sometimes you find yourself writing for the page count and then your scenes get a little long, I found, or you're rushing through them too because you want to get your pages up. But yeah, I think in general, just day to day, get your own pace. But I found if you're not in a huge rush, if you're like, you know, if you're listening or watching this and you're just trying to write a screenplay, take what you think is normal and cut it in half for the first couple of weeks and like get your sea legs a little bit. Cause I would get really devastated when like, I would think like, man, I'm going to write, you know, seven pages a day, 10 pages a day. I can do this. I love to write. And then you can barely eke out four, you know, or three or one. It's really helped me to cut those expectations in half. And then you feel so much better. It's like, oh, I did four. That's great. And then if you can do eight, that's amazing. But like in general with a movie and if you have a tighter deadline, I try to do like five pages a day or try to get around, you know, about 25 to 35 pages a week, I think would be a decent clip. You know, there's good days and bad days. But yeah, I think in general, I try to do about five pages a day. Although I might be switching back over to doing maybe a scene a day. That's another way to do it. Of just like do a card a day. Do like I'm so bad at cards. I know I, I'm yeah, I was so, gonna say like, you didn't mention cards earlier. Did you use cards? No cards? You know, yeah, I guess you're supposed to. I don't love cards. There's no, but I, there's no rules. That's the beautiful yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I I never bought the whole cork board with card thing. I'm just I have such bad ADHD. I, I'm not that organized. Now that I see it, I think they are kind of helpful because it's a tactile thing. You know, when I was doing more comedy writing on pilots, I would try to make it more of a game. I would literally count the jokes on the page to see like if there's room for improvement. Like if you're doing more of like a sitcom, like a 30 Rock, a Parks and Rec, Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, Arrested Development, um, yeah. you know, anything like that, that's a bit more of a fast clip. You can really tell some scripts that don't have that pace. So if there's any like comedy writers out there listening or watching, make it like mathematical, take some of the magic out because I'm in my head all the time and I'm trying to wait to be inspired and all that. It actually helps if you treat it like a regular job, like treat it like you were looking at a spreadsheet. Like I actually, when I was just starting out, this made me a better writer. Yeah, I would I would take it page by page and I would have a little spreadsheet and I would say how many jokes are on this page? All right, there's three. Uh, and then probably should get two more, like get five jokes a page, get your pacing up. But again, that's only for like one of those high octane comedies for more of a dramedy, something like that. That metric doesn't quite work. It helps to have a little bit of like a mathematical game. I have found to just keep yourself steady or like have a little mini calendar and write down how many pages you did and add it up, you know, something to make it tactile or else you can kind of get lost in the final draft. You know, you can kind of get like swirled around a little bit. That's sound advice. Well, so riddle me this. How many days was the shoot? Like, what was the schedule? It was big. It was a long, long shoot. I think we started rolling cameras in like late June or July and we wrapped around November. So like- Of which year? 2021. Okay. So yeah, like three and a half months, maybe something like that. Okay. We'll get into the spoilers in a second, basically. And that's where we're going to see a little more of the behind the scenes writing and some of the bigger sequences. And so look, podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, we are going to get into the spoilers now. If you have not yet seen Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, press pause, go see it, and then come back. Because we are in the spoilers. Well, so right off the bat, I want to know about this Walden duck point that you were talking about earlier. Oh, yeah. Tell us what that is. The duck bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Duck uh, bill, uh, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. I, that came off way too harsh. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, it's all, good. it's all good. How dare you? It's the fucking duck <laughs> bill, man. No, that was something Waldron, I think, came up with in the Rick and Morty room. And it was really clever. An example is actually Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness, which I thought he did a really clever job. A return threshold around seven in the story circle. There's always that kind of like resurrection, literally like Christ storytelling, you know, like you come back to life, Superman 
glows up in the sun and he's back to life, you know, something like that happens. Or Woody and Buzz realize they're on a rocket and they can light the rocket to catch Andy. You know, there, there's always kind of that back to life moment. He's like, that's always good and joyful, but it's great when it comes from something really unexpected or something that like you didn't expect to be there. And he used the term duck bill because we would draw a circle and then he would just do a big zag. And it looked literally like a little cartoon duck bill. <laughs> like on a, It's like a circle, circle, circle. And then whoop like that. And I think in Dr. Strange, he pulled that off really well, where it's like, okay, Strange is back. He defeated the other Strange. He's got to get back to face Wanda. Any normal movie that's like, okay, yeah, yeah, normal. He gets back and he's there to fight Wanda. And Waldron had that good idea of like, oh, wait, how can he get back to fight Wanda? He's stuck over here. Wait, what if he uses that dead body of his and he animates the dead body? Like something just a little extra surprise that people didn't see coming usually is a nitro boost or something. In Quantumania, what is your duckbill moment? Oh man, did we have a duckbill? I would probably say, I don't know if it, I don't know if it qualifies as a duckbill, but probably that ant army coming in. That, that's more of like a Chekhov's ant, I would say. <laughs> like you, <laughs> right. you set them up in the beginning and you kind of forget about them, but like they clearly are there. Hank sets them up in the basement and then you see them disappear. And there's a couple quick hits along the movie of like Hank getting signals and stuff. I don't know if that's more of a deus ex antenna. I don't know if that's a duck bill, but that'd probably be my example of it. Of I like, mean, I love it. Like they live, as you say, like a thousand years in one day <laughs> because of the time, you know, restraints of the quantum realm. So it was very organic because you're having ants come in to save the day. And yeah, what- that that to me was a big part. Like we we went back and forth about what we wanted to do. Like we were going to have a big quantum realm armies and creatures and all that. But I felt pretty strongly. I'm like, you know what? Like any movie can do a Lord of the Rings alien charge. Like, you know what? It's it's an Ant-Man movie. Like have Kang just talking shit on him the whole movie and have like ants win big at the end. I think that would be like a fun I, surprise I, I thought, win. I thought it was great. Well, so it's always fun in the spoiler section to hear about left turns. So yeah. what is an idea that you had that you thought was going to be in the movie for a day, a week, an hour, a yeah. month, and <laughs> it was totally not like discarded? It was it was like not even filmed. So it's not even oh. like a deleted scene. It was like a concept. <laughs> oh, yeah, plenty. You know, some of these I might use for Kane. There was a lot more Kane in a lot of different ways. Uh, yeah. I don't know how much I can say. Some of that's just going to be Avengers. We were going to kill Hank at one point, and I was going to have him be like reanimated, like his consciousness was going to live on through the ants and he was going to be like, <laughs> like mentally controlling them. I, I actually uh-huh. really like Yeah. Yeah. He was going to be almost like this hive mind of the ants. And like, uh, <laughs> I, I like that. That didn't go too far. There was a psychological sequence in that probability storm or that quantum nexus. There was more of yeah. a dream sequence element to it. I had like a big, like man sized ant. That was going to be almost like a Ninja Turtle, the way they looked in that 90s movie, like a like not CGI, like make yeah, it almost yeah. a, like a Cronenberg the fly kind of like ant. And it was like in his head. I wanted it to be voiced by Werner Herzog and give nice. him some sort of like holy mountain kind of advice or like just some vision quest thing uh, that didn't get in there. I mean, there's a lot more Kane backstory and a lot of Kane lore that didn't get in there that we thought was maybe distracting or maybe better served in an Avengers movie. Who beat him? What happened? The pitch in general is like, what happens when Julius Caesar is assassinated by 50 other Julius Caesars? You know, that I thought was really cool. But I do see how that would have maybe slowed down the rhythm of the movie or something. There was a lot more MODOK. We filmed this. I got killed by MODOK in the movie, which I really loved. (laughs) He killed you uh, like you acted in it. Yeah, yeah. I, I was uh, there was a, just this runner of no one respecting Modoc and everyone hating him. And like there was a great scene where like Michelle Pfeiffer just cut him down because she has no idea who the hell this guy is. And like right. he knows her because like he, you know, was Hank Pym's protege. And like he's like finally face to face with her. And Michelle Pfeiffer is like, I have no idea who the fuck you are. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, when like, did uh, you guys have the idea to use Modoc? Because, you know, people were bummed when the Pat Oswald animated series was canceled after right. one season. But then it was like, oh, like now it makes sense why they did that, I guess, because they were going to, you know, go in a different direction with oh, Modoc. Sure. So when I mean, did that idea come about? You know, Modoc was pretty much day one. And okay. I wish I could come up with a Darren Cross connection, but I think that was Peyton. I think they just realized like, oh, man, we've got a home run here. Like, because literally Darren Cross got all disfigured and stuff. So like, oh, that actually would logically give yeah. us a Modoc in but yeah in regards to the hulu show jordan bloom like wrote a fantastic show and like i took it as a challenge of like okay those guys have like the comic book modok he's in aim he's got the bowl cut the jokes you would expect and want and the and really good jokes um 
kind of from the comic book vein of Modoc. So our take on Modoc allowed us a little more freedom and allowed us to do kind of this like death of a salesman Modoc, <laughs> like <laughs> this really just like broken, bitter man who <laughs> Scott Lane quite literally has the life he always dreamed of. <laughs> he has been gone since before the Avenger. Like he doesn't know Scott's an Avenger. Like he doesn't right. know. Like there was a scene of him finding out just everything that's happened to Scott. <laughs> and like he's an Avenger. He's been time traveling twice with Captain America. He saved the world. He's dating Hope, the woman that Darren loves. Hank Pym respects him. He's part of the family. <laughs> like he has everything Darren would have wanted, and Darren right. is just a big head. <laughs> and he just, just to really play up that like patheticness, and then you know that I think would have led to more of the heel turn at the end, or you know you're just stuck in a bad relationship with this Kane the Conqueror guy. That's funny. I mean, I it, it played really well with the crowd both times I saw it. You know what what happened to Louise, Dave, and and Kurt. You know, his friends, was there ever anything for them in this movie? You know, I think that was settled before my time. Yeah. I kind of see it as like a Thor thing, too. Like Thor had all those little buddies and Thor had like Darcy. And I think it was similar to that. How like you could have worked him in. But, you know, there's so much for Michelle Pfeiffer to do. We have two villains that are pretty big, heavy hitters in the comics. We wanted to give, you know, Hope and Arc with her mom. We wanted to give Cassie her own kind of origin story. It felt like as much as you want to do, you know, that Louise story and like everyone on Twitter, it, it, it just didn't quite fit. And the last thing you want to do is to underperform that as well. Right. So, yeah, yeah I, I, it is kind of like a, it's like a Darcy situation or like a Jimmy Woo situation. It's like, ah, like, yeah, I just don't know if it didn't quite fit. And, you know, you got to take the punches on that. But well, it, and there'll, it, there'll be other movies. They 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 will still come back. I, I would, oh, no, no, I they all died. Yeah, they, they died off screen. Uh, they they all got really, <laughs> really bad food poisoning and uh, died to get, they shit themselves to death. Uh, <laughs> it happens good. to the best of us. Ooh, hey, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. Of course, I also hope you check out today's sponsor, ScreenCraft.org. But a quick thing about Backstory, you know, if you've never read us before, you could test drive us on a desktop or laptop by reading our free issue. Issue 37, our free issue, happens to be our Avengers in-game issue. So if you're a Marvel fan, this is a perfect way for you to check out what we're all about. And folks, our Oscar issue is live. That's right, our 10th annual Oscar issue is live. But if you want to become a subscriber and support independent film journalism, and I know you do, you could use discount coupon code SAVE5. That will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. But look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. And folks, I hope you also check out today's sponsor, ScreenCraft.org. ScreenCraft has years of experience of putting together writers with agents and managers to launch their careers and is a great resource for learning more about your craft through screenwriting lectures and entering genre-specific screenwriting contests. ScreenCraft winners and finalists throughout the years have gone on to write films and TV for Netflix, Amazon, Apple TV, Universal, Blumhouse, Lionsgate, Hulu, ABC, and more. So I hope you'll check out ScreenCraft.org to learn all about it. But now let's jump right back into our conversation with screenwriter Jeff Loveness about his debut feature film, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. Just going back for a second, we learned a bit about the quantum realm in Ant-Man 2. Just, you know, to talk for a minute or two, you know, obviously Janet Van Dyne was stuck in the quantum realm for 30 years. The second film was basically them finding a way to recover her, you know, to bring her back. Yeah. And so you're dealing with Ava Star. You're dealing with the fact that when she comes out, it's interesting, Janet has these kind of healing hands and she's able to you know help ghost you know aka ava star be you know no longer interdimensional but like kind of grounded here in reality and control her power if you want to call it that and so it was interesting because you see janet in our world using an actual right. power was there ever anything on the books to have janet do that in this movie because interestingly She's not using like healing hands or something like that right, in, right. in Quantumania. I guess, yeah, we can talk about this. This is after like, yeah, this is the spoilers uh, stuff. Yeah. 
<laughs> that was that was in there for a bit. I think in my first draft, I had some Ava Star stuff, actually. I mean, yeah, there's just been a lot of bites of the apple here. Yeah, yeah. And Janet's got obviously those healing properties, but, but I looked at it as more of like less healing and more of like, oh, she's got a bit of that interdimensionality phasing as well. And she was able to almost okay. like stabilize Ava. We wrote that, it was in there. And I think it just it was just confusing the viewers in our test screenings of like, wait, she has phasing powers? Like what's going like eventually. So, so are that- you saying that Janet was able to kind of have that ghost? A little bit. That was kind of it. And it came from the core, actually, when she touches it and steals it from Kane. And they're in that yeah. big fight scene, like when she blows the core and she's like grabbing for it, that almost like gave her those powers, almost in that Captain Marvel way, like getting that raw energy kind of destabilized her hands. And then when Scott going down there into the eye of the storm kind of destabilized him and split him off into those, all, all those variations. So yeah, that was a, we had Janet with a bit more superpowers and I think it was a bit too much shoe leather to explain. And if you watch closely, if you go back to watch the movie, <laughs> there's a part where like they just landed the jungle and Janet Janet pushes him against the tree and says, like, do not move. And the light goes over them. I think it's clever editing. But like in the script, that was like she phases them out of sequence. And so like the scanner misses them because she phases them both out. And it really hurts like Hope and Hank and uh, Janet's in a lot of pain. And, it, and that was like, oh, wait, you can still do that? Like, what is what is going on down here? That was almost tied into her trauma. It's like she can't really control these powers well. Being in the quantum realm makes her more unstable. And it was a part of that Kane core of like, she made that sacrifice of almost like touching a hot stove, you know, and running away with it. And it really kind of like messed her up. It would have worked so well. But I mean, I, I could understand how some people that don't remember that bit from, you know, Ant-Man yeah, 2 could be confused because- the edit in the movie, it just seems like they're hiding under a big mushroom. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's I, like I saw that like, too. I was like, <laughs> scanners can't see through mushrooms. Yeah, it. I, yeah, that was my thought too. Like, well, yeah, fair enough. All right, yeah, that works. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it, it worked. It worked. You know, yeah. I, I'm curious about what you learned about Kang that was set up because I'm not even trying to ask anything about the future of Kang Dynasty right. or anything like that. I'm just talking about when you came on because. You know, he who remains was the head of the TVA on the TV show Loki. And similar to Kang and Quantumania, he also tells them, like, I'm the nicest version you're going to meet. I'm trying to fix something before something really bad that I see happens. And it's up to you what you're going to do. It was interesting to kind of see that echo. But something that I noticed when I did a rewatch of it that I thought was really slick was you have these little miniature animations on his desk where he's explaining mm. the history of Kang so far. And he's talking about Kang's traveling interdimensionally to trade technology and, you know, knowledge with each other. And they're all holding what looks like the canister filled with a yellow glow of the same canister with yellow glow that we see in quantum mania. Was that something that was coming forward just the whole idea for this movie of restoring his engine, that concept, because there's like four Kangs holding these little canisters with a yellow glow in that miniature Loki moment. Yeah, I mean, that, I guess that ties into a bigger Kang question in general of like, what is his technology? What makes him such an existential threat? What makes Kang similar to each other and unique? And then the Rick and Morty guy in me is like, okay, you also just don't want to rip off the portal gun or like the Rick technology or whatever. But like, yeah, and and I guess this gets into spoiler territory and like, you know, but I'm sure people have picked up the fact of like, oh, he has ring technology. That's interesting. Or he's got, you know, he's got... Oh, those glyphs look a little similar. So like, yep. I think we'll be seeing that Kane has had his fingerprints on the MCU for a long time. And if you saw the end credit scene, it teleporting in looked very similar to someone else as well from Multiverse of Madness. So like, I think there is an, a concerted effort to kind of tie some of his technology language together, but without saying too much, I suppose. But he's been all over. Well, so when, when did this idea of smashing the interdimensional drive come about to trap him in the quantum realm and that being kind of the focus of the movie? Movie, him trying to restore it and get out and then them again trying to stop him. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought that was an interesting story point. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, like, you know, in classic blockbuster storytelling, it helps to have a little MacGuffin or an Ark of the Covenant kind of exactly. thing. But to me, it was like, well, there is something really interesting. And in like, if a time traveler crashes in the middle of the desert or on an island, you know, you have a ship, but man, you need that rocket fuel or else you got nothing. And I thought about how frustrating it would be to be a man from the future and you crash back in caveman times, how the hell are you going to make rocket fuel? You know, like, how can you get out of there? And it's, and that seemed to me so sad and so tragic and frustrating. 
and simple on a plot mechanic. It was yeah. like, he can do anything. He has so much power, but he's it's just out of reach. And all he has right now is his armor that, you know, he was able to get that before Janet blew the core and did all that stuff. And I thought that was a way to kind of humanize Kane because like, one thing in the comics, again, I, I love him. He's a great character. But if you just went full Kane, he's pretty omnipotent and he's pretty hard to beat. You know, his whole thing is that he can't lose. He loses all the time, but he just keeps coming back. And so I thought it would be more interesting to sort of do step one of the guy. You get to do more of the lion in winter. You get to do more of Napoleon in exile. You get to have like a broken Alexander the Great. You get to start at the end of the story. I forgot if we mentioned this bit before or, or not, but like I love in those epic stories how like four books have happened that you don't even know about. Like in Lord of the Rings, they're talking about Morgoth. They're talking about like the fall yeah. of the Valar and stuff. Like, what what are they talking about? The trees, the Silmarils, what's that? I love how there's like a backstory you don't even know about. Or Game of Thrones, you know, like Baratheon's the king, but they're talking about, you know, everyone is living in the wreckage of the king that was deposed 50 years ago, you know? Right. like So I thought it would be really cool to take this guy that has been literally king of the multiverse and just thrown into Siberia, basically, or thrown into, you know, Malta or right, uh, Cyprus, right. wherever Napoleon was. And to have that vessel of escape right in front of his face, but because he lied to his friend and because Janet is a more noble person than he is, she gave up her chance of freedom and, and blew this whole thing up to keep this genocidal guy out. That just seemed like a pretty simple, clean plot point to kind of get everyone on board. Again, it's Ant-Man versus Kane. How the hell do you even make that compelling? I thought, well, what's the one thing Kane doesn't have? What's the Coke formula that he doesn't know in all the world? Oh, he doesn't know Pym particles. That makes the Ant-Man family really important to him. And I, I, there probably wasn't time for this in the, the scripting and all that, or, or the, you know, the, the script that goes in, but like it shows Kang's character, but he's always kind of underestimated the Pims. Like he's stolen technology from everyone to Reed Richards to Tony Stark, you know, all this stuff. Right. But you know what? He didn't look at the Coke formula. <laughs> like he doesn't have yeah. Pim particles. That seemed like a way for the Ant family to really one up him. If you could shrink that thing down or blow it up as we did, there was a version of the script where Janet shrunk it all the way down to like a, you know, like a grain of sand basically. And you had to get in there. Uh, but it just made a bit more visual sense to make it big since they were already pretty small, you know, <laughs> to kind of give Janet that uh, heroic moment was really important to me. And because like, I actually, I really like Janet Van Dyne the comic she's so funny and plucky and like a founding member of the avengers i think she named the avengers well so to really ask, get like like what her backstory is of those 30 years missing because you know everybody refers to it which is cool and we don't need to be filled on on everything because that would be a bore but was there was there more that you cut out because she's pretty widely hated and you know she's known as somebody that clearly started the freedom fighter movement against yeah. Kang, and then everybody resents her for leaving and it allowed Kang to possibly take over her departure or he probably was going to be taking over anyhow. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a good point. We had more sequences and there was a lot more Kane action and there was a lot more Janet freedom fighter stuff with Jentora as well. And those freedom fighters, like they literally knew her and I see why it got cut out because like, there's, right. there's a lot of story, but that was actually really cool. And that was a chance to really show Kang's like viciousness and his like just tearing through people trying to get to Janet and trying to get those pin particles back. That was really cool stuff because it was like, you saw the guilt on Janet. She couldn't hide anywhere. If if people were taking her in, they would be slaughtered. You know, she was on the run. If she tried to fight him, he would level this place. I thought of like, you know, man, Mesoamerica going up against like the Spanish conquistadors who had that clear sure. technology advantage or, you know, like to make it just seem hopeless. You are everyday society going up against a guy from the 31st century. Like it's not even close. And then that prompted why Janet would be out on the outskirts, staying way out by herself. And, you know, and then when the second movie happens and she has this brief chance of escape there's almost a moment of like i shouldn't be here like i should get out of here because like i'm just gonna get these people killed more and more and it's slightly selfish too of like at the same time oh my god i just want to go home like maybe i can forget about all this maybe i can right. if i'm gone he'll never find me and like but it's almost like the u.s you know getting out of vietnam or getting out of afghanistan it's like well a lot of people are also going to die because of that. Like, there's no good options here. That, I thought, was a very fascinating thing. Just not really enough time to get into it. A lot of stuff with hope as well that got streamlined out. But, I mean, yeah, they're just fascinating characters. There's so much to do in a two-hour movie. 
I love the probability storm. It was a moment in which it, it's truly, you know, something that's only an Ant-Man movie in which the solution was to have multiple versions of himself build this like ant tower up. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, to, to reach for it. It, it was fantastic. Tell us oh, some, thanks, of the, some of the maybe weird stuff that you wanted to do in the probability <laughs> storm that never even made it to being shot. And just the idea of it as, you know, he's not just shrinking down to go in and grab the engine. He has to go through this psychological disarray in the quantum realm to get it to, which again was really smart. Oh, thanks, man. I mean, yeah, full credit to like our visual guys, our second unit director, Dan DeLude. He really helped streamline this thing. I mean, there were just so many versions of this thing, but that was such a fun sequence. There was a good hope sequence inside that storm as well. And hers was a bit more psychological. She was in almost the upper strata of the storm while Scott was down below. And so she was getting like almost like hits of the multiverse at once or like almost like glimpses into other lives like oh, more of a mental thing with her and that was really i thought evangeline did a great job there other and that lives was, that she could have led or other lives her mom yeah little wrong. glimpses of that it was like you're almost getting like the fumes of the multiverse or something you're getting like little garage fumes of other lives and seeing stuff i don't know how much to get into there but like it paid off later as well like why she came back for scott there was a version that kane was in there as well and there was modok in there too <laughs> did you ever see the movie sorcerer yeah. Just that energy of like three guys trying to get across that river together and they don't know if they trust each other. And like there yeah. was a version where Kane went in with Scott and Cassie was in there too. Oh, and wow. I, that was fun. Yeah, because uh, that's totally Sorcerer in which they don't trust each other. They're all on this mission. They want to get yeah. paid, but they also are cutthroat, you know, thieves. Yeah. And then Kane was going to just like leave Scott down there, you know, like one right. of those things. Um, that would have been cool, but I mean, I'm very happy with where we landed. Of like, it just makes sense to make it a more Scott centric thing. But and then the challenge as a writer was like, well, there's plenty of fun stuff you can do. You can do lots of, you know, there's the multiplicity thing, there's the Baskin Robbins Scott thing. That's all fun. Both times I saw it, that is the biggest laugh in which oh, wow, the Baskin yeah. Robbins Scott shows up and, you know, they're talking to him. And then you hear like literally off in the distance, somebody say, does he have ice cream? Uh, <laughs> and, and like oh, that, cool. that shout does out he to have ice cream line. I think that was Laura Jennings, our editor. I wish I could take credit for that oh, one. Oh, it's so good. I, I'm probably the worst writer on the movie. <laughs> now that I think about it. No, but that, that's Laura Jennings. That was, I think that was her edition. But the hardest part of that was like, okay, what is the scene actually about? And how can Scott Lane alone do this? And that's where like the Cassie through line came in. And it's probably good that she wasn't in that storm. It's like, no, no, put her up there. And it's like, oh yeah, if Kang was down here, if the hundreds of people that Kang sent down here, they all fail because there's a million versions versions of them and they're all fighting and they all just eat themselves. Scott Lane, though, it doesn't matter the multiplicity. It doesn't matter how many possibilities or choices he can make. That's when it kind of clicked for me. It's like, oh, they all want the same thing. They all want to get out of there. They all want to see Cassie. Like, that's what can kind of coalesce them by hidden socialist uh, solidarity messaging of like, oh, we all kind of secretly want the same thing. And when we all kind of fight each other, nobody wins. But if we all kind of realize we all at that fundamental core level do want the same thing and we should work towards the same thing, you kind of see how powerful you are. So yeah, the ant messaging actually kind of worked out. It worked perfectly because it keeps it completely organic. The most off the rails version, there was like the psychological dream. There was the Werner Herzog ant. There was like a talking version of his book. That was pretty dumb. Like, that like a so big much. book chasing him around or something? Something like it, I think the book crashed and that's what like broke them all. You know, there's a lot of reasons we go through revisions. Mainly I'm very dumb. I'm a very <laughs> dumb writer. There was Jerry Rice and Joe Montana showed up once because uh, he's from san francisco and it was like psychological it's like who are his childhood heroes <laughs> yeah it was like jerry rice and joe montana got killed in front of him i mean that that <laughs> did not make it very far <laughs> but i that's, remember liking that that's absolutely insane well you know one of the tough things to do though is to bring it all home it's interesting because you have again this self-sacrifice in which Again, it was great that, you know, the, the death of Modoc was very funny, you know, like when he's like, I'm an Avenger too, aren't I? You know, all, all those elements were coming together nicely. You're seeing Cassie develop and, and we know that she becomes young Avenger. That was cool. But basically at that ending moment, you know, they're going back through the portal because Kang has been destroyed by Modoc and the ants, which I think was a good combination. I think if, if one of them did it by themselves, 
it might not have worked entirely. Like you're like, right, can right. the ants really do that? Or can Modoc really do that? It was the fact that both of them were doing it at once was interesting. Yeah. Right? Any other demises of Kang that you want to tell us about? I'll, t- I'll take the punches for it from, you know, the internet or whatever. Like, I think that is actually a very Kang the Conqueror way to go out. If you read the comics, that guy is arrogant as hell and he has so much technology. That was the thing of like, he is just a man. And so like, if you take away his toys or if you're able to bust open his shield, or if you're able to like, get a little weakness in there, you can take him. Well, that's and why so it works that... for me because because it's ant technology from a thousand years, you know, in a yeah. day that we don't even know. To me, it was like the Starship Troopers element too of like, you know, you can be a thousand years in the future, but if you get dogpiled by a tidal wave of Starship Trooper ants, you're going yeah. down. Man. Yeah. Like, and like it was more, yeah, like Modoc comes in. Modoc has cane technology because he got built up and all that. So like, Modoc blows his shield and then that allows them to kind of sweep over him. And then, yeah, like he isn't defeated. He gets a suit busted open. But th- that basically gave us the chance to really give it like a Sam Raimi, Spider-Man 1, Green Goblin, Tobey Maguire fight. We really wanted to go down to like him versus him and make it really brutal at the end and also show off how cool Kane is. At the same time, he doesn't need all that tech. This is a warrior from the future who has probably killed Captain America hand to hand. Like this is a guy who knows how to fight. And so like, we also wanted him to get his hands really dirty. And that was a way to really strip him down and have it just be a one-on-one fight. And then, yeah, like because his arm is so destroyed and Scott is able to outsmart him with the shrinking thing, Hope coming back in with her blasters is able to kind of knock him back a little bit. Oh yeah, that was the thing. We had Hope getting some upgrades from the ants as well. Oh, that's cool. (laughs) I think that got cut a little bit, but we were going to give Hope more of a punch. I suppose, with her tech and weapons. Was there ever a version where Kang lived? Who's to say, man? Who's to say if he's he's dead at all? That's 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 true. That's true. I'm very behind on my script. I'm trying to decide what's going on right now. (laughs) I don't know how much to say here because this might affect Avengers stuff. Yeah, there were discussions of what to do there. Any permutation you can think of at that ending, we probably bandied it around. But at the same time, and again, I'm I'm willing to I'm willing to take some heat from TikTok or whatever. Like I think the good thing about this movie, I don't. I don't really care about setting up a phase five. I don't really care about that's plenty of stuff beyond me. What I wanted to do was do a really good underdog ant movie. And to me, that is the Rocky element of like, oh, this guy that should not win through the strength of his family and through the guile and through being a little thief and doing some tricks. Like he's able to beat the most powerful guy in the multiverse because he got underestimated. I think that's a pretty cool story. And like to the fans out there, don't worry. Kang is going to have plenty of moments. It's interesting to pick your exact ending moment, though, because I absolutely loved Scott back in San Francisco walking Mm. down the street saying like, yeah, this is weird. But I did it right. I did it. Yeah. And it it almost seems like the movie's over. And then you cut to this restaurant for like, you know, a good little joke and Cassie's fake birthday. But he again has that same voiceover. So was that restaurant moment added later? Because I could have seen the movie just ending with him walking down the street. Like, it's fine, right? Yeah, we were deciding whether to cut it there or not. Like, we shot all that stuff at the same time. But that was a discussion, too, of like, oh, we could just kind of pop out there. But like, I think thematically, it's a small little, you know, light motif or whatever. But the movie starts with him, you know, kind of coasting on the fact of, like, I kind of missed some birthdays. Sorry about that. And it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's like, I'm going to... Stop asking questions. You know what I want to do more than anything in the world? I want to make a few birthdays for my daughter. Like, I don't, you know, I want to make up for some lost time. And like, that's the master of both worlds thing we're talking about. Like, in the beginning of the movie, he's carefree, he's coasting. And he's kind of on top of the world. He has that big adventure. He comes back to the Shire. But this time, he's keeping secrets from the whole family. Like the beginning of the movie, everyone's keeping secrets from him. This time, he's keeping a secret. He knows the truth probably, but he's not willing to do it. And he's finally making a somewhat selfish choice of like, you know what? No, I just want to have my daughter's birthday. I just want to eat this cake, even though I know it's bad. And like, he kind of shovels it down and like, (laughs) I don't know if listeners will get the theme there or if I nailed it. But like, I like putting Scott Lane, the guy who literally saved the universe, is now wondering if he's the guy that ruined it again. The whole multiverse is now hinging on this guy as he eats a piece of cake, not knowing if he fucked up or not. Exactly. Well, really quick, because like a few lightning questions, because I know we're over time. Was there ever a version where Hope and Scott were trapped down there and did not make it. I mean, 
we talked about it. That was certainly like in the mix. I like where we ended up because like on paper, it did make some sense of like, oh yeah, Janet made that hard call and Scott can make that hard call. And you know, the end was romantic and all that. However, in execution or like doing it, we just kept getting dinged. And I think it was just like in our heads of like, ah, this is quite literally what happens to him at the end of Ant-Man and the Wasp. And it is effective and it's good, but like we tried to make it work and we talked about it and you know like there's endless scripts of like trying it out but like on one hand it works and on one hand you're just literally repeating the same beat i don't know if people would have been down for scott being in the quantum realm for the third time you know well, because fans Uh, know that he's somehow going to get out yeah like because i've seen that online and all that like i certainly see that point and there were moments when i thought that was a good road as well but like i think in execution it would have seemed like more of the same it would have seemed like oh he's in the quantum realm again and like you said now we know how to get there. Cassie's built that device. Like, I think it's better to have her use that device to save him than it is to wait three years for her to do the same thing right. in Avengers. I mean, there's plenty of room for debate and all that, but I, I think I'm happier with where we landed. Okay, two last questions. So yeah. people were elated. You know, your post-credit sequences were great. The Council oh, of yeah, Kings yeah. were a blast, you know, to see it like come to life the way that we saw it. Of course, it's great to see Loki and Mobius and, yeah. you know, to see them with Victor Timely, as he's known, just a, you know, a man interested in time. No, nobody. Taste a little fish food. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, he doesn't look like somebody else we know. And and so was there ever a version that had like Loki and Mobius more active in it? No, not really. I mean, a okay. little bit, but that never quite, you know, they were in production on their end. Like that right. show, you know, they're doing a whole TV show over there. Like I did write, I don't, I don't like to talk about this too much, but like I wrote a couple Planet of the Apes style endings I don't know if I should say of like I'm just like I said I'm an X-Men guy and like I don't even think I could legally do it but I'm like oh, I'm gonna throw Gambit in there <laughs> Cyclops or whatever but no no it never got into a serious place there was talk of that but I know they were in heavy production on their end and like that seemed like the most we can kind of pull off I loved how at the end of the movie it doesn't say that the Avengers will return but it's like no Kane will return it was just us kind of handing off the baton to Loki because that's the next time you're going to see this guy which is great well so final question what was your toughest scene on the page Thomas what was the one that you kept coming back to over and over again and how did you creatively rise to the challenge what was the scene that you were sweating you know there's always technical stuff like all that stuff in the probability storm is probably technically the hardest thing to crack but on a creative level and this is the most thrilling part of the whole movie oh man i didn't even talk enough about jonathan as an actor i love that guy he's Amazing. so passionate and focused and kind and, and hardworking. he and i went back and forth in a good way of like trying to really get to the heart of this guy to me my favorite scene in the whole movie is the Janet flashback of like getting to know Kane and specifically in there it's the quiet scene where Michelle kind of opens up about how she feels like a failed mother and the last thing she did was lie to her daughter and she can just see her daughter waiting for her and she just thought she would have more time you know all that Jonathan's acting is so good because we know who he is she doesn't but we can kind of see him still he's not lying to her he just doesn't want her to know who else he is you can see the Julius Caesar of the multiple multiverse, you can see this guy slowly remember how beautiful time is in a small life. And you just see him slowly open up telling her the life time, like what you think it is, like, it's not what you think. And then you get a little of that villainous touch of like, it's a cage and like, you need to free yourself from it and all the things that breaks you. But like that to me was my favorite scene because you got to really see the conqueror, this kind of great man, almost bestow a gift to someone who saved his life. It felt very classical to me in the way of like old stories like Greek gods, you know, would get disguise themselves. And if someone was kind to them, they would give them something or like Simone Bolivar was always on the run. And you know, if a common person loved him, they would help him or he would give them something, you know, like you would hear about Julius Caesar paying his soldiers well or Magneto in uh, X-Men 2. Man, I love that moment when he's talking to Pyro and he just tells him like, what's your real name? You know, or like when, when you really see the humanity behind that guy and yeah. realizing this time God can use time for something compassionate. He's not lying to her. You really see it in Jonathan's performance. Like he's not bullshitting her. He's not trying to like he will it. send her back if she took him he, up on the offer. And like she saved his life. And like, you know, he was on the verge of death and this stranger took him in. And like he is not going to forget that. And like to give that kind of Xavier Magneto kinship between the two of them. I think that whole Janet flashback scene was like just beautiful to to write and to yeah. experience and 
really harness with Jonathan and Michelle. I thought it was cool too. And and you kind of do believe that he would have sent her back or he would have sent Scott back as well. They both were like, no, we're not going to take the consequences of what you're going to do. The next time he and Janet meet, there's a line where he's like, what did you see? He's like, you know, we never got a chance to talk about it. But like, and you know, that scene went through a lot of, you know, you got to navigate the exposition and the character. But like that, I loved writing that scene too, because he's so lonely and he was almost hoping that she felt his whole story. And like, are you the only other person that can see what I'm up against and like what I'm doing? And, uh, you know, that's Avengers talk for later. But like, I really love the tenderness that Jonathan brings to this guy before it all just, you know, goes homicidal. He's so good. He's an amazing actor. Well, look, I thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Jeff, I can't wait to see what you do next, which I know is going to be Avengers the Kang Dynasty. Ooh, let me see if I can buy another two weeks from Marvel. I got I to gotta get these pages done, man. <laughs> and I'm glad you went and see it with your kids. That makes me feel really happy. Like, I, yeah. I think that's like the perfect kind of movie to go and have a fun time with your kids and see it, big ants. It was a blast. Uh, the only thing I would say was a bummer. The theater turned on the lights <laughs> after the first post credits roll. And we saw these people getting up mm-hmm. to leave and they, they did walk now. out they did not see the loki and like a few of them i knew were marvel fans and i like went to the manager afterwards and said you might want to keep the lights off and they're like well we want people to be able to see to get out of the theater i'm just like i've been going to movies all my life like what are you talking about the lights have to be on well they've you only made 30 the audience that there's nothing else <laughs> they've only made 31 of these movies people need to know that there's an incredible well that i agree with like i kind of said to the kids i'm like I can't wait till they're talking about this movie with their friends and their friends say, oh yeah, what'd you think when Loki and Mobius showed up and they'll be like, what? We yeah. saw a wrong edited version. <laughs> you know, it's like they left. Yeah, they left. Uh, well, they good left. talking with you, man. Thank you yeah. so much. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to screenwriter Jeff Loveness for being so generous with his time and chatting about his debut feature film, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. And folks, I hope you also check out today's sponsor, ScreenCraft.org. And while you're surfing around online, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. If you've never read us before, you could test drive us. And if you happen to be Marvel fans, I hope you realize that our free issue also happens to be our Avengers Endgame issue. So this is a perfect chance to explore what we're all about. And our Oscar issue just came out. So you've got to check that out because it's full of scripts and interviews that we know that you will love. And if you want to save $5 off a one-year subscription, just use coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where you could see these Zoom casts and see the screenwriters speak. It would really mean a lot to me to have you support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2023. All rights reserved. And folks, if you want to get a hold of me, you could find me as Yo Goldsmith on Twitter or Backstory underscore Mag on Twitter. Those same handles work for Instagram, Yo Goldsmith on Instagram or Backstory underscore Mag on Instagram. You could also check out my Facebook fan page and I'll respond to you there as well. Or you could be old fashioned and write an email to BackstoryLetters at gmail.com and I'll get back to you as soon as I can there as well. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A. Thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.